Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar on impact assessments, getting it right first time. So just to introduce um, ourselves to you, I'm Christine O'Neill QC, I'm a partner here at Brodies in the Government Regulation and Competition team. I am fairly regularly involved in advising clients who have to carry out impact assessments and um, on the other side of the fence, perhaps, I'm also a member of the Equality and Human Rights Commission's panel of council in Scotland and represent the Commission from time to time. I'm joined by my um, colleague Joanna Boyd, who's an associate in our government um, regulation and competition team, and Joanna, like me, is also giving advice regularly to clients on impact assessments. So in terms of our agenda for today, um, we are going to give you an overview of what impact assessments are and how um, those are to be done by reference to a range of publicly available resources. Um, we're also using this webinar to share a new toolkit which we've produced here at Brodie's that draws together the various um, different assessments that you may need to produce and hopefully gives you some um, guidance again on the resources that you might want to use in order to complete those assessment exercises. We're then going to look at three specific types of um, impact assessment, which are very commonly um, required, uh, quality impact assessments, fairer Scotland duty impact assessments, and children's rights and wellbeing impact assessments. Uh, you'll appreciate that in an hour we will not do these exhaustive justice and all I would say about that is if you do want further information or indeed if you're interested in bespoke training on any of these impact assessment processes we'd be very glad uh, to look at that with you. We also know that there are some people attending uh, this webinar who are very experienced in carrying out impact assessments. There are others for whom the process is uh, a bit newer. So for those of you who are very experienced, forgive us if we're telling you things uh, that you know. And indeed, if you have any disagreement with our approach or any comments to make, please do stick those in the Q&A um, text box as well. Um, one uh, caveat is that we're not looking at environmental impact assessments, and those are not covered in our toolkit Kit, but we are at least contemplating uh, a different toolkit for environment related impact assessments. So if we move on to what an impact assessment is, uh, it's, it's a tool and it's a tool to assist organisations in ensuring improved service delivery. It's useful for policy development and it's also importantly useful for compliance with certain legal duties and obligations. And I think what we would say is that an impact assessment process of whatever kind is a valuable thing um, to engage in in any policy uh, development exercise, even if you're not yet mandated by law to carry out that impact assessment. Uh, another obvious point we hope is that there's no one size fits all approach to impact assessments and what they include will depend on the particular duty that you are conducting the impact assessment for and the decision being taken or the policy being made. Um, the Equality and Human Rights Commission's guidance acknowledges that in order to um, fulfil these various duties, you don't need to follow uh, a specific methodology or complete a particular template uh, in order to fulfil your duty. And indeed, that's also been um, recognised by the courts. I'm going to mention a case a little bit later um, called Sheikh against Lambeth Borough Council. But what the High Court in that case said about this particular point was that they accepted that the duty, um, and this was the public sector equality duty, is not a duty to carry out an assessment. Um, it's a duty to have due regard to, to the equality objectives. And assessment is a tool used to create the evidence base to show performance of the duty. Now, as we'll come to in Scotland, the position is very slightly different because there, there are some specific duties around carrying out assessments, but um, I think that's quite a useful and helpful phrase that the assessment is the tool that creates the evidence to show performance of the duty itself and isn't performance of the duty itself. Um, and I've mentioned the three uh, impact assessments that we are going to look at Today, um, I should also mention that guidance often refers to integrated 
impact assessments and we know a number of organisations carry out integrated impact assessments, that is to say, uh, using one single exercise to carry out an assessment of a range of different things, whether that's in relation to the public sector equality duty, the Fairer Scotland duty, children's rights um, and welfare impact assessments. An integrated approach is absolutely permissible and indeed is probably a good way of managing the resource burden of impact assessments. But I suppose the warning there is just take care if you are using a single process for a number of different statutory regimes, you do just need to check that you're covering off all of the requirements of each regime in that one integrated process. So if we move on to the next slide on why um, you might do an impact assessment, and um, we can reduce this text actually to uh, a couple of sentences. You um, will want to do an impact assessment because it should make your decision making better. Um, it should help you to identify the impact of a decision or a policy change on individuals or groups of people. Um, it should help you to think about the evidence that you need um, to measure that potential impact. And it should help you to think about how you can avoid or mitigate um, that impact. So it should be around a better decision making. Um, but there's always a downside and the other downside or other reason why you um, might do an impact assessment is to mitigate the risk of a challenge, um, a legal challenge to the effect that you failed in some way to carry out your legal obligations. Um, the caveat again is that it doesn't do simply to carry out an impact assessment. What's needed is a good or at least an adequate impact assessment. It's not to be a tick box exercise and to be done properly does need time and consideration of the issues. Now, if we move on, what you'll see when Joanna comes to talk about the very specific um, impact assessments that we're covering in this session, and I'll pick up on the, the last one at the end, is that there are a number of common themes um, and that's helpful the impact assessment process for each of these different regimes looks in many respects similar and um, none of it should be terribly surprising um, and as I say you can you can spot the themes emerging as you go through the guidance and you go through the process so we mentioned screening this process of thinking about whether you in fact need an impact assessment because um, you don't always need a full impact assessment exercise in relation to a decision or decisions. That will depend on the nature of the decision and the impact that it might have. Um, and there is a proportionality dimension to that and a relevance dimension to that. I'm very interested in the theme of gathering evidence um, because all of these processes require you to examine the evidence that you have um, and to think about um, what that evidence suggests in terms of the impact assessment. But I think one of the really tricky and interesting questions around impact assessments is the extent to which you should be proactively going out to obtain new evidence and additional material beyond that which you have on the stocks or you have obtained as a result of your day-to-day -day work, um, specific evidence to inform the impact assessment process. Equality and Human Rights Commission would certainly say that where you've got evidence gaps, um, you should be identifying those and doing something about that. Um, I think one of the things I've seen with a number of clients is a concern about the extent to which that involves information sharing with others who might be subject to the same or different uh, duties. And particularly in the context of personal data, the extent to which you should be seeking and obtaining both personal data and special category personal data about protected characteristics in order to inform the impact assessment process. So gathering evidence is part of this, but it's, it's certainly uh, something that involves uh, thinking about what's really needed and taking some care to ensure that you're doing the right thing. Um, and if we move on to the next um, slide, we do want you to have something to take away from this webinar. Um, this is a, a, a reference to a number of publications that we think are useful in helping with the impact assessment process. So that's guidance both or, or from the Equality and Human Rights Commission 
um, and from the Scottish Government um, on each of these different impact assessment processes. But we're also, as I mentioned uh, before, and uh, just to, to let you see on the next slide, the front page of um, our own impact assessment toolkit. And, and that toolkit um, goes beyond the three impact assessments we're looking at today. It lists a number of impact assessments that you um, might uh, need to carry out. It identifies the legal regime under which those are required and points you in the direction of resources that might be um, useful to you. And we have included a link um, to that impact assessment in the chat uh, function for this webinar. Please um, do have a look at that and we can send it out to you after um, the event. So that's where you can get some of the material. And um, before we turn to the impact assessments themselves, I think I should also just mention a little bit about the, the negative aspects of this. So what can happen if you do get it wrong? Um, and these are a number of cases from the Scottish and the English courts on the public sector equality duty and um, the role of impact assessments. What I would say is um, that these are only a selection uh, of cases and there, there's a, actually a very substantial and growing body of case law on the public sector equality duty uh, that is referred to in these cases, very helpfully summarised in these cases. So again, if you want to have a look at them, if you, you're not familiar with them already, they're worth looking at and they will take you um, to the, the kind of key decisions that have been made by the courts uh, in the past on how um, the public sector quality duty in particular should be approached. Um, McHattie is a Scottish case from a couple of years ago on a decision to close an adult day centre, um, which was challenged on a number of grounds. Um, but one of the grounds of challenge was that there had been a failure to comply with duties under the Equality Act and that the council had failed to carry out um, an EQIA. What's quite interesting about that decision is the way the, the court, which um, was, was not well disposed um, to the council in this case, I think it's fair to say, um, the court narrates what, what was clearly troubling to it in terms of the history of um, the decision making in relation to this closure. And one of the things that troubled it was that it felt that there was a, a lack of clarity around when decisions were actually being made and when therefore a full equality impact assessment ought to have been conducted and have been um, available. And um, the court was, was concerned in this case that um, the, the council had engaged in what it uh, described as, as an exercise resembling a tick box exercise. So wasn't able to demonstrate to the court that there had been a, a true application of um, the minds of the, the relevant people to this exercise. Now, a failure to carry out um, a, an equality impact assessment, a failure to fulfil the public sector equality duty will not always result in the underlying decision being um, ruled to be unlawful or out of order. Um, in this case, though, the, the, the court was persuaded that the actual decision to close the centre um, should be reduced, should be quashed. That's a, a serious um, impact for the authority concerned. It's, it has the potential to have a serious impact on timing and on other processes that are going alongside this kind of decision making. So it's just a I suppose a red flag warning um, around what can go wrong. Uh, by contrast, um, in rights community action against the Secretary of State for Housing, um, this was a challenge, uh, again, on a number of grounds um, in relation to um, planning matters. And here, uh, the court was satisfied that the public sector quality duty had been properly addressed, that the impact assessment process had been properly um, done and it's a, a useful um, decision in terms of setting out at some length the steps that had been taken by um, the UK government department to fulfil um, the public sector equality duty. Shake, I think, is probably the most interesting of all three of these cases. It's from this year uh, and it's about uh, really the question of when you do your equality impact assessment and what you do once you have an equality impact assessment in terms of monitoring and further 
um, work around um, equality impacts. Uh, this, this was about a uh, low traffic neighbourhood um, traffic orders and um, these are the kinds of things we've also seen in Scotland, particularly during COVID, where new restrictions have been put on um, roads and pavements to encourage um, pedestrians and cyclists at the expense of motorists. Um, and it was interesting because at many levels you would expect that these kinds of orders which are favourable to pedestrians and cyclists would have a, a good and clean bill of health um, from a, an equality impact assessment perspective. But the other side of, of this particular coin was that a disabled um, person, the claimant here, um, relied very heavily on her um, car and felt that the needs of disabled people who did rely on cars hadn't been properly taken account of um, by the council. Now, in fact, the, the court was satisfied that that had been done, but there was a discussion about the way in which um, the council had acted at speed, partly in response to um, COVID uh, urgency, partly in response to government guidance on a, a rapid basis. And the fact that the um, authority had in essence adopted a, a rolling approach to the equality impact assessment process by doing an initial assessment, then going back and, and doing some more work and continuing to do more work while the policy was in place. Um, now, the court found that in this particular case, that was permissible, um, despite the kind of general view that you should have the outcome of your equality impact assessment before you make your decision. But they accepted that in this particular case, um, that was permissible. I think it's interesting because it's an English case and the Scotland specific duties don't apply. Um, and Joanna's going to go on and say a little bit more about, about those. But the Scotland specific duties, which apply to public authorities in Scotland, um, do require, it seems to me, something akin to a rolling approach to equality impact assessments. They require both that assessments are carried out um, when decision making is being undertaken, but also that the results of the, um, the equality impact assessment are fed into any revision of policy um, that's being undertaken. And, and there is a, a sense for me about that of a, an ongoing and continuing process. So again, just to put those um, cases on your radar. Um, that's my introduction to um, what we're covering today. I'm going to hand over to Joanna, who is going to talk about equality impact assessments and the Fairer Scotland duty impact assessments. Joanna. Thank you very much, Christine. So as Christine said, um, I'm going to touch upon EQIAs and then the Fairer Scotland duty impact assessments. So as many of you will be um, well aware, EQIAs are prepared in connection with two pieces of uh, legislation, the duties uh, on public authorities under the Equality Act 2010 and the duties that arise under the 2012 regulations, the specific duty regulations that Christine's uh, touched on just there. So if we move on to the uh, next slide, we've set out there uh, just a very brief overview of the Equality Act uh, of 2010. And again, this will be very familiar to many of you that the Act itself is centred around the concept of nine protected characteristics. I, you'll be happy to hear, I'm not going to read them all out, but you'll be well aware that they include um, protected characteristics such as age, disability, uh, gender reassignment, just by way of example. Now, in the Act itself, uh, what it does is it prohibits certain types of conduct, such as discrimination, um, harassment and victimisation. Now, in terms of discrimination, that can be both direct and indirect. Um, where it's direct discrimination, that, just to put it very shortly, means less favourable treatment. And that's found under Section 13 of the um, Equality Act. With regards to indirect discrimination, that's about a, a provision or a criterion or a practice which in itself is discriminatory, and that's in Section 19 of the Act. The definitions of harassment and victimisation are set out in sections 26 and 27. 
So in addition to prohibiting certain conduct, what the Act also does is it imposes certain duties. And what uh, we are going to talk about in some detail today is the public sector equality duty. So the complaints and challenges that can arise here can be brought both on the basis of non-compliance with those duties uh, and in addition around engaging in that prohibited conduct that we talked about previously. So if we move on to the next slide, what we've uh, got here is the public sector equality duty, often referred to as the general duty, uh, and what it means. And that duty is to have due regard. Now, we're, we're going to talk in a, in a few slides about what exactly is meant by having due regard to something. But this slide is really just to demonstrate what the three needs are. So the first need is around not doing the bad stuff. So um, eliminating discrimination, harassment, victimization, or any other uh, prohibited conduct. The second need is about advancing equality of opportunity. And in the legislation that's described in a bit more detail as removing or minimizing disadvantage, meeting the needs of particular groups, compared to uh, that may be different from the needs of others and encouraging uh, participation in public life. And then the third need, um, which again probably receives less attention than the first two, is around fostering good relations. So, so how do we do that? We do that by tackling prejudice and by promoting understanding. So if we can go on to um, the next slide, again, we describe uh, the juicy uh, who does it apply to? Of course, it applies to public authorities, but what sort of functions are they carrying out when they're under that duty? So they could be uh, providing a service, making a policy, or um, as the duty applies to them as employers themselves. Now, it's important to um, just remind ourselves that you cannot contract out of the public sector equality duty. You can't delegate it to an external organization, even if that organization is carrying out a function of a public nature on your behalf. And I think that that is a very important in, in uh, situations where quite often um, another body or business or organization may indeed be carrying out some of those functions for a public authority. Um, it has to be complied with when you are formulating the policy, changing it or implementing it. And as Christine's already touched on, it, this is an ongoing duty. It's not a, a, a once, and, once and for all and that's it done. You've got to keep uh, your policies um, under continual review. And the final point there on the slide, of course, you'll all be aware it, it was not suspended um, during COVID-19. It's been ongoing throughout the crisis. So I promised we come back to due regard. What does it mean? Um, again, as Christie's mentioned in relation to public sector equality duty, there is a lot of case law um, and the courts have given much attention to what is meant by due regard. Um, I would recommend two cases in particular to you if you, if you want to go and look at, into um, what the courts have found in relation to due regard in a bit more detail. Um, the first of those is, is the HOTAC case, and that's HOTAC against the London Borough of Southwark Council. It's a 2015 case, and often in conjunction with that case, uh, reference is made to Brown, Brown against the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions from 2008. And again, just looking at those two cases in the round we've put, and we hope it's helpful to you, um, what due regard means in the context of decision making. So the approach to um, public sector, sector equality duty has to be proportionate, relevant, it requires more than just thinking about it. Again, we often see reference to it not being a tick box e exercise. Um, it needs to be applied with rigor and an open mind. It must influence the final decision uh, and be based on, on evidence. We need to be thinking about if there are ad adverse impacts, um, how are we assessing those? How are we taking active states, uh, steps to mitigate against them? An important point there about um, not being able to justify retrospectively actions that are uh, or decisions that are taken um, through the use of an EQIA. Um, it's not retrospective. It's something that should um, that should join in the the, the evolution and, and really the beginning of that policy uh, development process. And you have to be able to show that you've had due regard and that that was uh, done both in the development of a policy and when a decision 
was made. So how do we demonstrate all of that? Well, it tends to be through um, an equality impact assessment. And if we can just move on to the, the next slide, um, as Christine mentioned, we, we said we'd just deal very briefly with the specific uh, duty regulations from 2012. Um, these, of course, apply only to listed authorities that are set out in Schedule 1 to the 2012 regulations, but they do set out duties including, and again, many of you will be familiar with this, um, setting the setting of equalities outcomes and also reporting the mainstreaming reporting duty uh, as well in relation to that. Uh, regulation 5, uh, I think uh, Christine touched on, very interesting just to compare that with the decision in Shake. Uh, regulation 5 of the 12, 2012 regulations requires authorities to assess the impact of applying a proposed new or revised policy or practice. Again, important to note the word revised. So when you are revising a policy, if you fall uh, under these regulations, again, you should be thinking about how you are assessing impact. So if we could move on to the, the next slide, um, what we have here now is our what we hope is helpful to you and it's a step-by-step -step guide to the sorts of questions that you might want to be asking yourself when you're undertaking an EQIA. So in relation to planning the assessment, um, as Christy mentioned, scoping is also um, something that you have to have in mind. Um, is an EQIA necessary? When you get to the point where you're actually planning your assessment, uh, we've just set out there using some of the uh, commission guidance um, as a useful uh, tool to think about what are the appropriate questions to be asking yourself. So what are the aims of the policy? How do they relate to equality? What aspects of the policy are particularly relevant to each element? That's the three needs of the uh, public sector equality duty. Which groups are going to be affected? Um, and how might you involve those groups and those communities? And what evidence do you have and, and where are the gaps? And if we could just um, move on then to the, the next step, which um, as we've said, uh, and as Christine's mentioned, the question of evidence. So is there evidence that the policy might result in um, discrimination, harassment or victimization? So that's your, your first need. Um, does the policy build in reasonable adjustments? That's particularly important where there's impact on disabled people. Uh, does the policy remove or minimise disadvantage suffered by people or groups of people? Um, and do you need that increased participation of any groups in order to make your policy? Does it tackle prejudice? Does it promote understanding? Again, that's uh, more in relation to the, the third need of fostering good relations. And just when we're thinking about that, that evidence need, one example might be um, a decision, you, you need to take a decision, to, for example, to close, say, a community centre in a rural area. Um, now, that community centre might be used by older people, it might be used by um, carers who are looking after young disabled people, it might be used by a, a mum, mother and toddler group. So there you'd need to be thinking about, so what are the communities of place? And by that, I mean, what are the residential communities that we might need to engage in, in this process? And who are the communities of interest? And by that, I mean the groups, you might think of them more in terms of the protected characteristic groups. So engaging with older people, engaging with disabled people, engaging with young mums. Um, so I just use that by way of a very short example, when you're thinking about the sort of evidence, if you don't already have that evidence that you might need to be thinking about. Assessment and improvement, of course, absolutely critical. What are the main impacts? How could the proposal be improved if it does um, have a, a discriminatory impact? Um, how can that be reduced? How can it be avoid avoided? How do the impacts of anything alternative to the proposals that you have in front of you compare? And how does this policy help you meet those three needs identified in the public sector equality duty? So if you move on to the, the final slide here in relation to assessing impact, so you, you're now at the decision stage. You've considered the potential or actual impacts. Um, how do you make that informed judgment on what changes should be made? And we've set out there the four potential options. So option one is you don't need to change your policy. You've assessed it and you believe that it is robust. 
the evidence has demonstrated there is no unlawful discrimination and you've taken all of the opportunities to advance equality and foster good relations. So subject to the, again, that critical point uh, that Christine mentioned of continuing to monitor and review the impact of your policy, uh, you can then come to your conclusion that you are not going to change it. What you should be thinking about is documenting reasons as to why you're taking the decision you are and the, and crucially, the evidence that underpins that decision and supports it. The second option um, is you need to adjust your policy. So that might involve taking steps to remove barriers uh, to better advance equality of opportunity and foster good relations. You may not need to change the whole policy. You may need to just change one aspect of it. You may decide that you need to introduce additional measures to reduce or mitigate against any of the, um, the negative impacts that, that you have in front of you. The third option is you continue or adopt the policy um, despite potential for adverse impact. Um, and again, as part of the EQIE, you should be setting out very clearly what your justification is for doing this and how the decision has been taken um, and why it's compatible with the public sector equality duty. So if you consider, for example, that discrimination um, that arises is lawful because there's an object, an objective justification for it, then you have to record that. Um, record what the uh, objective justification is and um, also um, the policy and how you have reached the decision that you have. Final option is just stop. You're going to, you're not going to proceed with the policy, you're going to remove the policy because there are those adverse effects and they're not justified. And the final, uh, final, final step is publication. So um, that is a very quick run through of um, EQIAs. We hope that's useful to have those, those steps and those questions in mind um, in order to get to the end of the process with a very ro robust EQIA that can underpin your decision making. So if we can move on now to the Fairer Scotland duty impact assessments. And again, many of you will be aware that uh, this duty arrives, arises out of section one of the 2010 Act. And again, there's a due regard in there. You have to have a due regard as a public authority to socioeconomic inequalities when you're making strategic decisions. The duties um, only apply to certain authorities. They're listed under section one, subsection three. Um, and again, we've just set out there um, the, the duty here is to have due regard to the desirability of exercising functions in a way that's designed to reduce inequality of outcome. And, and I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this in the work that you're doing um, every single day. Now, you'll, and you'll also recall this came in in 2018, but we've had much more recent um, guidance from the Scottish Government from the beginning of October that uh, if you're subject to this duty, you must take into account. Um, I think it's important also to say here that strategic decisions um, are dealt with, what, what they might um, entail, and that's set out at pages 15 to 16 of the guidance, and it gives a series of examples. So, for example, in local government, it might be the development of a local development plan. So all around your planning decision making, strategic housing uh, de decision making, uh, strategic, strategic housing plans. Um, if you are making major investment decisions through a city deal, that's likely to be a strategic decision. Um, away from local government, maybe you are making some other sort of major investment uh, plan your annual budget is likely to be a strategic decision. Or if you're undertaking a major procurement exercise, that's also likely to be a strategic decision. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. We've just set out um, here again what the uh, Scottish Government Fairer Scotland Duty Guidance says about defining socioeconomic disadvantage. And again, all the things you would expect to see low or no wealth, low income, material deprivation. Now, what that means is how households being unable to um, acquire goods and services. So that might be something like IT hardware, no access to a laptop, no access to broadband. Um, that's the sort of uh, thing that we're thinking about there. 
area deprivation, um, again, very familiar to many of you, that's about the Scottish index of multiple deprivation, which is about identifying your communities uh, where poverty and deprivation exists. And um, socioeconomic background, I think it's worth just mentioning, again, it's defined in the guidance as being structural. So that might be um, your uh, parents' education, um, income, uh, careers, um, all of those sorts of uh, matters might come into play in terms of socioeconomic background. Uh, the guidance also sets out what that disadvantage can result in. And again, um, no surprises here, poorer skills and attainment, lower health life expectancy, low paid work, greater chances of being a victim of a crime and less chance of being treated with dignity and respect. So on to the next slide. Again, Scottish Government guidance very much uh, in rhythm with the EQIA guidance that we've had uh, from the Commission and indeed from the case law. Not a tick box exercise takes place well before reaching a decision and influences that decision. Um, it should be helping you with your corporate, your strategic and your equality um, outcomes that are sought by uh, your organisation. Um, it should make sense to you as a public body in relation to the work you do and also to the people and communities that you serve. Um, it should help bring about demonstrable change is what the guidance is telling us. Um, and the final point uh, that we'd like to make there is around uh, the Scottish Government recommending that authorities publish a written assessment um, showing that they have complied with the Fairer Scotland duty. And yes, this is our final slide on Fairer Scotland duty. It's taken from the guidance. I'm not going to go through it other than to say um, it is the same as an EQIA, the various stages, save that at the very beginning, you should be thinking about um, whether the proposal or decision is strategic or not. And on that note, I'm going to hand uh, back over to Christine, who's going to talk about the children's rights and wellbeing impact assessment. Thanks, Joanna. Um, and uh, just to remind everybody that if you have got questions um, arising out of anything we have said or will say this afternoon, please do add those um, to the Q&A function. Um, on children's rights and wellbeing impact assessments, um, you'll have worked this out by now. There's nothing terribly dramatically different about the children's rights and wellbeing impact assessment process, although there is separate guidance to help with identifying the kinds of impacts that there might be on children and how you might go about assessing those. But in terms of the structure of the approach, it's very much in line with what you've already heard this afternoon. Um, these impact assessments are used to identify, research, analyse and record the anticipated impact of any proposed law, policy or measure on children's human rights and well-being. They can help you comply with your duties under the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014. And when it is, when she says it is passed or, or when it receives royal assent and comes into force, um, the UNCRC Incorporation Scotland act as it will be bill as it is at the moment and of course the uncrc itself um, in our toolkit we do have a number of links to guidance on these kinds of impact assessments and the scottish government's um, guidance includes and we've, we've given a separate link to this uh, a training tool called an introducing crwia um, a 20 minute a uh, training tool so there is a, a kind of short um, kind of pocket sized piece of guidance within the main guidance from Scottish Government on this, which um, you might find helpful. There is no prescribed format in the same way uh, as there isn't for the other impact assessments, but as I say, we have flagged the guidance to you. Um, and it is now, I think, simply expected, and, and, per and perhaps rightly so, that a CRWIA is used when you're considering any policy decision that might impact on children. So if we move on, we've mentioned these two pieces of legislation. Um, the 2014 Act obviously has been in force for some time, um, and this is a requirement to report on the steps that you've taken to secure better or further effect of the requirements of the UNCRC. Those duties are being um, added to 
and um, supplemented by the duties under the UNCRC and Corporation Scotland Bill. Um, again, I'm, I'm certain you will know this, but the bill was referred to the UK Supreme Court because the UK government had concerns about certain aspects of it. The Supreme Court has ruled that certain aspects of the bill are outside of the Scottish Parliament's legislative powers. That means the bill goes back to Parliament and is waiting for the Scottish Government to come forward with proposed amendments that would deal with the Supreme Court's um, concerns. That does mean there is going to be a delay in the bill being given royal assent and coming into force. And, and as you may remember, if you've been on our other sessions about this particular legislation, um, the bill is due to come into force six months after royal assent, so that's when the clock really starts ticking, um, but this will require um, much uh, more serious approaches to children's um, rights impact assessments uh, and, and increased reporting duties as well. So if we move on, it's, it's very much what you have seen before. There is a screening um, process or you can adopt a screening process to decide whether or not you need to have an impact assessment. If you do, then you have to gather the evidence and prepare your impact assessment. And when you've done that, you should be publishing it at the end of the process. Um, and again, just to flag our toolkit, one of the links that we've given there is um, there is on the Scottish government's own website, uh, a page listing all of the children's rights and um, well-being uh, rights and well-being impact assessments that they have done and that they have published and you might find those useful um, just looking at the way in which it has been done elsewhere the guidance um, contains a number of templates that you can use too so if we move on um, I won't spend a lot of time on this you have to screen you have to think about whether your policy or measure is liable to affect children and young people what the nature of that impact is likely to be what groups of children and young people might be affected and, and reach a decision on whether an impact assessment is uh, to be required. Once you've done that and you've decided that it is, if we move on, um, there is a strong emphasis in children's rights um, and wellbeing impact assessments, as there is elsewhere, but a very strong um, element here of involving children in the impact assessment process involving stakeholders and giving them their voice and, and um, the guidance refers to the particular elements of the UNCRC that are focused on giving children um, their voice in the process itself. So that is a, a particular dimension of the UNCRC that you should be having in mind. And if we move on, um, again, once you get through that process of gathering your evidence, thinking about what you've been told, making sure that you've spoken to the right people, um, you should be making your decisions, um, you should be publishing a summary version of your impact assessment. And by summary, we don't mean um, you know, peremptory, it should be sufficiently detailed to allow people to understand how the assessment has been undertaken and how um, your decisions have been made. And we've set out there the kinds of things that we expect you will want to have in your summary. So if we um, move on, that's essentially all we wanted to say about the processes of impact assessment and to flag um, the resources that are available to you. We are very happy um, to answer uh, questions. And um, one of the first questions I'll just take, Joanna, I don't know if you if you're still with us, you want to come yes. back on the screen. Um, one, of, one of the questions that has been asked, and I'll let you answer it first, is um, what, what, what most commonly goes wrong um, with the impact assessment process in our, in our experience? I think there's a number of things, Christine, that um, could go wrong. Um, but, but I think leaving enough time, um, I think if it really is a last minute sort of consideration, then um, the organisation is much more exposed to it becoming a tick box exercise. So I think thinking about it as early on in the process as you possibly can is really important. Just give yourself the, the time and the space. Um, I think related to that is thinking that it's just one person's job. So if you have someone that deals with equalities or inclusion, diversity, that that sort of area then thinking that um, it's their job when actually really it's a collaborative exercise and I think the more collaborative across teams 
um, it is, then again, the more likely you are to end up with something that is robust, that is defensible, that is evidence-based. Um, I think also there's a lot of focus on the don't do the bad stuff, so that first need and perhaps less focus on um, what it means to advance equality of opportunity. I was going to say exactly the yeah. same thing, Joanna. I think, I think that's absolutely right. I think I see a lot of um, organisations really understanding the need to avoid discrimination and harassment, but, but then slightly forgetting that those two other needs exist. Yes, exactly. And I think it's right that you're more likely to get a challenge or, or have a successful challenge brought against you if you if you get that first need wrong, because in, in many senses, it's the worst bit to get wrong. But you mustn't forget, you know, you mustn't forget the other two needs. Um, but I think I, I think just as you'd mentioned, Christine, as well, the evidence and under, you know, what underpins your decision making process, you know, that's absolutely crucial. And you, you may well as an organisation have a lot of it, that information. Um, already to hand but if you don't then just again are you giving yourself enough time to and is public participation necessary do you need focus groups uh, do you know where to go to get the information and the evidence that you need okay questions now coming in thick and fast so um, I'll take I'll take a couple of questions on the children's rights and, and well-being impact assessments a question around when when the act the the, the bill will become an act and and come into force I mentioned that it's back with Parliament. I think we must anticipate that it may be, it may be up to six months to a year before um, the the amendments are made and the process concluded. I know that um, the politics of it are that that the government is coming under some pressure from other parties in the Scottish Parliament to to get moving on that. So it may happen sooner, um, but it's certainly not going to happen the, this side of of Christmas. Um, a question about whether there's a similar body of case law on children's rights and wellbeing impact assessments similar to that um, under the Equalities Act. No, not yet. Mm -hmm. um, certainly not in anywhere in near the same um, kind of volumes. What you do have are, are quite a number of cases from the Scottish courts about what the UNCRC means or, or particular articles of the UNCRC mean but in the context of existing legislation, so what it means in terms of the right of children to participate in court proceedings that affect them, the, the, what it means in terms of parental rights or, or the rights of children, um, for example, to participate directly in, in children's hearings uh, processes and, and that kind of thing, but not on the impact assessment side of things. What I would say is I think that the principles that we've seen established uh, for equality impact assessments carry over very very well to children's um, rights and well-being impact assessments save that as i've mentioned this strong emphasis on the involvement directly of children in the process next question um joanna are there if you are looking at policy options and there are different options but one preferred option um should you do an eqia for each of the different options that's an in, that's a really interesting question and, and the context I can imagine that may come up is in uh, budgetary decision making. So there may be various options um, that are in front or intended to to underpin what that ultimate decision may be. I think there there is. I don't think it's a question of doing an individual EIA in respect of each option, but if there is if there are alternative options that are there uh, in front of the um, in front of ultimately what will be the decision maker in relation to that, um, then I think it is important that you do have evidence um, and a, a proper reasoned um, route that can be followed as to why you ultimately chose one option over another. I, I completely agree with that. Certainly for whichever option is chosen, you should have a robust um, EQIA, but if you are presenting different options to decision makers and there may be different impacts if you do an EQIA process, then I think it is beholden on you to do at least, you know, an adequate EQIA process for the different options, even if it means that you do something further um, beyond that once you've narrowed down um, those options to a preferred option. So I, I don't think you can choose your I don't think you can make your preference or choose your preference without having some work done on the um, equality impacts of each of those options. Um, another question that's been asked is whether there's a time frame for publishing 
equality impact assessments and I'm just looking at the specific duties regulations for Scotland. So if you're governed by the specific duties regulations, then you must um, publish within a reasonable period. Um, now, there's no, um, there's no definition of reasonable and what you have to publish are the results of your assessment. So you actually don't have to publish the whole assessment. You could publish a summary version of it within a reasonable um, period. Uh, I, my own view is that it, it's, it's as well to get the, um, the results out sooner rather than later. Um, because what you don't want to do is create a situation where you publish something after a decision has been made and you possibly create the potential for another judicial review and the time, the, the three month time limit for that may start to run whenever you publish your EQIA outcome and, and you don't want to be sitting waiting for that to happen. So I'm in, inclined to the view that when you've done the job, then it's worthwhile um, publishing it sooner rather than later. I think, Christina, the only th point I would add to that is just that, that if you don't do that, the additional risk is you might create the perception that it's come after the event. Yeah. And that's something that you, you definitely want to avoid. Okay. Um, so thank you, everybody. I think, I think we are now at the end of the questions that we've been asked um, in the, the Q&A uh, session. You have our your our contact details there. Before you go, um, can I ask you please uh, one favour, when you leave this webinar, you will get a pop-up survey asking you for your feedback. It's not from Zoom, it's from us. Um, and we're really keen uh, to get your feedback on the session, very keen to get your feedback on, on these webinars generally and what we could be doing differently or better. So um, please, if you don't mind, um, and you've got a few minutes, uh, and indeed I'm, I'm sure it'll take you less than a minute, um, but if you've got a little bit of time, could you please not dismiss the, the pop-up survey? Please do let us know. Um, what you think uh, of it and and please also let us know what you think of the toolkit if you think it can be improved if you think there's more that could go into it and um, please uh, do let us know and thank you very much for coming along um, this afternoon that's us for today bye-bye <laughs>